Hello and welcome to ThinkPod, powered by the FII Institute. I'm your host, Mark Barton, and for over two decades, I've been at the forefront of global conversations on the issues that matter the most. In this series, I'll be meeting the leaders who are rising to tackle the grand challenges that face humanity right now. Together, we'll be discussing the radical ideas and the transformative solutions that'll benefit both people and planet. This episode, I'm joined by Julia Hoggett, Chief Executive Officer at the London Stock Exchange. At a troubling time for public markets, we discuss the role of stock exchanges in promoting a just transition to a greener economy. Julia, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. What role can, should, will, do exchanges (laughs) play on the path to net zero? I think all of those words apply, actually. (laughs) So I think the first thing is that we should think we have a critical role to play. Mm. I always describe the role of stock exchanges as conveners. Um, Our job is to bring together those who have capital with those who need capital Mm. in service of an objective. And to me, the most important objective of our generation is the transition to net zero and the just transition. Um, So the first starting point is it's absolutely part of our role. And we should therefore think of it that way. The next question is how do you do that and what do you do? We think about it through actually multiple lenses because one of the challenges of this debate is it isn't simple, it can't be reduced to a tweet. It is complicated and it will evolve. And the things that we do today may be things we have jettisoned in three years' time because they haven't actually worked as effectively as something else that we've developed as a solution. And therefore we need to be capable of iterating whatever we do and operating on multiple planes at the same time. But Mm. fundamentally we think about it through four lenses. Mm. The first is how do we direct capital into the green economy and make sure that that can grow at the fastest pace it can do. How do we make sure we're financing the transition? And this is a really important point because sometimes you can reduce this to a binary discussion of invest in green and don't invest in, in brown. The only way we get to net zero, and even more importantly, stay there, is if the entirety of the economy moves on a global basis. Yeah. And therefore, we can't think of this as bifurcated segments of capital. We have to think about it as in a whole economy transition. And I, I sort of steal from Gil Scott Heron to say that the transition must be televised. It can't be that what we actually do is have a whole load of assets that should be transitioning that go into the private markets, get sweated out to the detriment of the climate, and there is no scrutiny over what's happening. Mm -hmm. Actually, the public markets can provide both the financing and the scrutiny of that transition of those assets and the utilisation of them and a proper public debate. And that, to me, is the most powerful thing that we can engender. The next bit is the data and the rule set that exists to support the movement of money around the system. Everybody will say at the moment that the data is not quite where it needs to be. Mm. Now, I understand that because this is lots and lots of complicated data to collect. I used to be a regulator. I ran the market regulation for the UK. And when the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures came in, um, we suddenly realised, as a regulator, we would have to regulate disclosures of corporates, not just on classical corporate finance tenets, but on climate tenants as well. So I had to ask myself the question, do I take all of my corporate finance geeks, really good ones, and turn them into climate scientists, or do I hire a whole load of climate scientists and turn them into corporate finance geeks? Well, you sort of have to do a bit of both. But we also need the next generation to realize that we need physics and finance to meet. The way we get to this transition is if we're actually embedding it in all economic activity. And therefore, people who care passionately about the planet actually need to care about accounting and they need to care about finance and they need to care about markets and they need to want to go and work in companies, not just think that they're on the outside of those But things. are they natural bedfellows accounting for people that care about the They need planet. to become so. That's, yeah. that's the point. That is the transition. So what I describe it as classically markets have been about understanding the net present value of future cash flows. Where we need to transition to is that those markets operate on the basis of understanding the net present value of future cash flows adjusted for their impact on the planet. That is the shift. And we have an awful lot of that architecture that has actually already been built, and a lot of it came out of COP. But we don't talk about it that way. We talk about it as an acronym soup of TCFD and um, TFND, and we talk about it through the lens of ISSB and et cetera, et cetera, yeah. I mean, acronym soup. And it's a turnoff. Yes, it's a turnoff, yeah. and nobody really knows, well, in service of what? What did that achieve? 
what it actually achieved is the equivalent structures to what we have already in classical corporate finance to do that adjustment for the impact on the planet. We now need to embed that, get better at it, learn from it, and anybody who's thinking about investing, not just impact investing or investing in ESG, but all investors need to start considering how they understand that data and evolve. Mm -hmm. And we have a critical role to play as a venue that sets certain disclosure standards, but also as a massive data and analytics company to support the transition of that data. Mm -hmm. There's another piece where we actually make rules. So I've gone from being a regulator to still having a certain of a regulatory role. So we were the first stock exchange in the world to actually produce the rule set for disclosure for TCFD for listed companies in the UK. So we can have an impact on just creating the rule set that makes these things happen. The final piece, and, and I sort of describe this as have soapbox, we'll use it. Quite a lot of people will say have soapbox, do need it, because at five foot one, I need a soapbox <laughs> for anything. But it's actually the advocacy piece. Yeah. As a convener, we sit in the middle of the market. And therefore, we can express what the needs of the issuers are and what the needs of the investors are and how the intermediaries need to evolve, etc. And so one of our biggest jobs is to be an advocate and, and talk about these things and talk about the complexity that we need to navigate and not be shy about it. We have to care passionately about the transition to net zero and take a stance and say, these are the things we stand for and this is therefore what we're going to change. And as a stock exchange... I get to do all of those things. You, you know? do. How, how do we navigate those complexities that you just mentioned? Yeah. It's, it's very difficult, and the answer, there isn't one straightforward answer to mm. that. One of my biggest roles, I think, is to be very outspoken about the need to reduce as few things as possible to binary decisions. It may be because I'm a woman, I don't know, but I see very few things as binary, including football matches. I can find an upside in almost everything. And as a consequence of that, my attitude is... We need to advocate for the complexity, we need to describe it, and we need to create rule sets and data sets that can actually accommodate that. We have certain challenges. Markets work on checkbox processes. They work on systematizing things. Actually, the new technologies provide an ability actually to produce nuance through natural language processing and, and more data crunching. But we have to really get on top of that and be very wary of people saying, that's good, that's bad. Because that presumes they've got perfect knowledge as to exactly what pathway we have to take to get there. And I haven't met anybody who thinks they have perfect knowledge on that yet. So we shouldn't be setting our structures up on that basis. It does mean calling out people who are saying, check the box, check the box. And it means being prepared to talk about the importance of... You're not afraid to call people out? Yeah, and the importance of the transition rather mm. than disinvestment. And I, I view the transition to net zero as the stewardship challenge of our lifetimes. And you don't get a seat at the table to do that stewardship if you disinvested. And therefore, you have to be really clear and, and purposeful in the way you, you talk about that. Engage, engage, engage. Yep. Let's talk about what the LSE is doing, because mm -hmm. you've developed this voluntary yep. carbon market solution, yep. VCM. VCM, yep. Break it another down. Acronym. Because, <laughs> yeah, another acronym. Yeah, at least we <laughs> explained what it was. Yep. Let's break it down, because yep. not everyone understands nope. carbon markets, yet alone voluntary carbon markets. Let's start from the beginning. Yep. Tell us what it is, tell us why it matters, and tell us yep. why it's making a difference. Yep. Okay, so I'll, I'll start from the very beginning of yes. my experience at the London Stock Exchange. Yep. So one of the things when I arrived I was asked to do was, was explore what our role was going to be in the voluntary carbon markets. Mm -hmm. Take a step back and explain what they are. A voluntary carbon credit is produced when you invest in a project that is genuinely additive to the amount of activity that is taking carbon out of the atmosphere. I'll give you an example. Yeah. If you were to build a wind farm off the North Sea of the UK right now with a viable offtake price because your energy consumer was going to say, I'll buy X number of gigawatt hours of, of energy from you at that price, that wouldn't generate a carbon credit because economically that's viable in its own right and it would happen uh, and is happening based on the amount of activity that's happening in the North mm. Sea at the moment. So you need to be investing in projects that would not otherwise happen. For example, sequestration that can take place in rainforests or other sorts of activity or indeed edge case technologies. And quite a lot of those activities actually can have other social co-benefits as well. So I started my career as an African development sociologist specialising in Malawi and my postgraduate research was actually looking at energy use and how Malawi transitioned after the energy crises of the 1970s and 1980s. One of the first voluntary carbon projects I was introduced to was actually looking at wood fuel use in villages in Malawi and how you actually create clean water 
so that people don't need to cut down trees in order to boil water that actually pollutes their homes, causes other problems in terms of child health and, and women's health, but is also destroying the planet. And the people are rationally doing this because they need clean water, and the only way you can do that is by boiling it and having a fire to do so. So if you actually go to the source of the problem, which is the lack of clean water, you can have an effect on the amount of fuel that people need. So that is the sort of activity that is illustrative, the sort of things that can generate carbon credits. So they have societal co-benefits as well, and they are directing activity and financing into places that wouldn't necessarily be natural recipients of capital. A lot of the focus in the voluntary carbon markets has been on how do you create the best trading environment for voluntary carbon credits. I understand why people are looking at that. I don't think it's going to solve the problem. For me, there is a chicken and egg problem. Yeah. To invest in a voluntary carbon project that produces voluntary carbon credits, you're not going to have an economically viable project in and of its own right. The value comes from the voluntary carbon credit. If you don't know what the price of voluntary carbon credits are, how do you have the confidence to invest in the project? Mm. But if you don't invest in lots of projects that produce voluntary carbon credits, how do you get a reference price to have the confidence? So you have a chicken and egg problem. So rather than focusing on trading the credits, we've gone back to that first principal problem, which is how do you direct financing yeah. into the projects that will generate the voluntary carbon credits? Because actually that's the thing that will change the world. That's the thing that will impact the planet. And so the, the focus for us is creating a fund market that will enable projects to be invested in through those funds. And the fund will have the ability not necessarily to pay a dividend in cash, but to pay a dividend in voluntary carbon credits. Now, the next question is who's going to buy them? Exactly. Okay. So the big change that has taken place over the last few years, and the UK is a leader in this, actually, and it's actually through boring acronyms. So I'm, I'm sorry, I have to go back We're to We're going to explain them. We're going to explain that. them. So it is now mandatory in the UK for listed companies to disclose according to the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Yeah. So there's an increasing amount of visibility and discipline as to what companies are doing, how they're governing climate, and the impact of their business on the, on the planet. Next year, it will be mandatory for transition plans to be published by listed companies in the UK and by asset owners. That is how they get from where they are right now in their emissions to net zero, by whatever date they have chosen to select. And we will always say that the first thing institutions have to do is do their own hard yards of getting to net zero. So they have to decarbonize their supply chains, their production processes, etc. But there will be certain things that they can't solve for yet. So if you produce shampoo, Part of your scope three emissions may be the amount of energy that is used when somebody consumes your shampoo or somebody uses a washing machine to use your washing powder. Now, if at the moment that client or that consumer lives in a country that is using coal-fired power stations for the energy that ultimately produces the hot water, then you as the corporate, you can lobby, but you can't necessarily influence that directly. So how can you act on those parts of your responsibilities for your emissions that you can't yet directly act on? Or there may be stuff in your scope one and scope two emissions, so there's stuff that is directly your activity that actually the technology can't solve for yet because it, we just haven't produced a solution mm. that doesn't have a hydrocarbon component in the production of that thing, and we can't substitute it out yet. This enables those corporates to say, I am genuinely committed to getting to net zero by this date. This is my problem field. In other words, I can't directly act on this yet, but I can invest in other projects that will get me on a net basis to net zero. And those projects would not otherwise have happened unless I valued my own transition and was prepared to pay for it and invest in it. So it eliminates criticisms of greenwashing? Well, my view is, and, and I understand that there have been people who have said voluntary carbon credits are basically either greenwashing or that they are not a substitute for doing the hard yards. Yeah. I agree. We're very, very public about that. Companies have to be thinking about this as a dual track process. They do the hard yards themselves, and they think about the voluntary carbon credits for the piece that they can't yet solve for. The great benefit of having the voluntary carbon market as a fund market on the London Stock Exchange is all of those projects then have to fall under the disclosure regimes, uh, the transparency regimes, yeah. and the market abuse regime in the UK. The regulator didn't need to change any of their rules. We just, by creating the structure, brought it in scope of the existing rule set. So the criticism at the moment at the mo of voluntary carbon credits is that over the counter, they're non-transparent. Yeah, and but this, this fulfills this, all this those. This fulfills that because anybody who produces this fund has got a disclosure duty akin to any listed company. And so all of a sudden you bring the, the sort of disinfectant of sunlight onto all of these projects and you create that discipline.
Now, if you're a company that is going to invest in them, you want to know that you're investing in credible projects. You want to know that you're investing in things where people are not going to say, ah, but that was a cop-out or that wasn't a proper project, etc. And the ongoing disclosure duty that you have as a listed issuer is something, therefore, that you can also take comfort from as a corporate. So by producing this solution, we hope that what we've actually done is not only direct financing into those projects, but create more trust, transparency and discipline around the market and create a product that actually is more useful for the companies that want to invest in them to buy. And have the backup of the fact that the UK structure of the mandatory disclosure and the transition plans really recognises that this has to be about the hard yards. Yes, G. We won't get into Tesla necessarily, but let's get into, does it throw up questions that need answering, like what is ESG? Should a company like Tesla be part of these, you know, ESG mm-hmm. benchmarks? What constitutes a benchmark? Weightings? Yep. Help us with this debate. Oh, it is at the heart of the complexity issue. Yeah. So we have lots of different indices. And fundamentally, it's about people recognising that if an index says these are our criteria, then an institution has to meet all of those criteria. How that is measured will be at the discretion of any individual index. But if it is E, S and G, Mm. then it's not going to exclude the S and the G, even if the E is good. And so when we reduce the idea of what ESG is to just a headline of, well, it's an electric car company and therefore it must be good, you miss the other components Mm. of what ESG are. But I think at the moment we are too focused on labels rather than the content of what's underneath the label. And as COP27 approaches in Egypt, in the African subcontinent, very important when it comes to the just transition and ensuring that developed countries invest in those nations. Is that going to be the big theme? I think it has to be. Um, It is the redirection of capital flows. I mean, I, I said at the last COP, that the global capital markets have been really good at directing flows between the global north. They've been, to be frank, utterly rubbish at yeah. directing equivalent flows. To the what south. are you doing? Well, you've told us what you're doing. What yeah. else are you doing at the LSE to ensure that's taking well, place? Well, I think the, the first thing is we have actually always been the most global exchange. Yeah. So we have far more companies from Africa than any other venue outside of Africa and have always thought of ourselves as a, a global nexus of capital. Look, I'm a development sociologist by training. I'm never not going to care about financing the Global South. And so creating the right environment um, and the right investor base for those companies to feel that London is the place where they can come and sell their story and get capital is absolutely part of our focus. And the, the voluntary carbon market is an opportunity to think about value differently because fundamentally the vast majority of the voluntary carbon projects mm. will be taking place in the Global South. And therefore, how you generate the investment in the Global South as a consequence of the need for those carbon credits is actually quite transformative, if we can get this right. It matters that it does benefit the Global South, though, rather than that we nickel and dime on the price of a carbon credit, and the people who benefit are the people who've already polluted in the Global North, rather than the people providing the solution in the Global South. So I think we need to be quite outspoken that that's part of the conversation we have to have. But there is a huge amount that is actually going on to generate those flows and to generate that structure of capital markets. We are not very good as capital markets experts at describing the value and the role of capital markets. For me, capital markets are about creating the capital that enables companies to invest in new products, in jobs, new production, and ultimately produces assets that mean at their most extreme, our pensioners don't die in poverty. That's what capital markets are for. Mm. They're not there to make bankers rich. And yet all the language we use is in basis points and bid cover ratios and all of that stuff. And it turns people off. And I think our job, as people who operate and care passionately about these things, is to be able to talk to people about that and then to make them accessible to those people who need the financing from them and be honest about the fact that we're not directing flows when we need to, when we, when we can. There's an image change that I know you mm. talk about Something that, to quote you, enables bankers to drive Lamborghinis. Yes. And I am a former investment banker. Yeah. So I've never seen the capital markets through that lens. Yeah. I, I came into investment banking 
as a graduate student, and I was research- as I said, I was researching Malawi. Yeah. And my frustration was I was sitting in the university library and reading books about Nyasaland, which at the time did not exist anymore. But that was the last time anybody had written a book about Malawi that was sitting in the stacks in Cambridge. And I was frustrated by how would I really understand what countries like Malawi actually had to do to operate in the global economy by being an academic. And so my father said, go and apply to the Emerging Markets Investment Banks because you'll probably learn far more in two years than you ever would sitting in the library. Mm. Um, I think he was also thinking, and you'll probably earn enough to pay for your PhD so I don't have to. <laughs> yes. um, but he, that was why I got into banking. And I've stayed in finance to answer different exam questions that I care passionately about. I became a regulator because I think investment banking is a really important industry, but it really matters that it's done well. What's the ultimate exam question that you care about? The one I care about at the moment is how do we create the best possible environment for high quality companies in a UK context to start here, to grow here, to scale here and to stay here. And that means we need to create the ecosystem that enables people who have really good ideas to start companies, but have the ease of the transition through as they grow. And quite often, markets are designed for the people who operate them. They're not designed for the people who need to use them and to benefit from them. And so reframing that conversation about how do we have a transition from private markets to public markets and thinking that it's our responsibility as a stock exchange to care about that is is part of how I've reframed our job. So my view is we want to be the first global stock exchange group in the world that's genuinely indifferent as to whether a company is public or private. Mm. Because if your job is as a convener of capital, it shouldn't matter. Your job is to get the capital to where it needs to go. And so for me, that's the passion project. It's to change people's understanding, to make people genuinely care that our capital markets are directing flows in the way they want them to, and to be engaged and realise that actually they can be a force for good. We'll finish on that note, on your passion project. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. In these turbulent times, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to ThinkPod for more insight and analysis.